Hello everyone, I'm Soma Mazumdar and I'm Orat Semsarzadeh and welcome to Kanban Lab Podcast. In each episode, we'll pick a common question and dive into a different aspect of Kanban, exploring its principles, practices and applications and answering that question. Our goal in this podcast is to demystify Kanban and help listeners understand how it can benefit their teams and organizations to addressing the common misconceptions, clarifying concepts, and answering questions about Kanban. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another special episode of Kanban Lab. Uh, morning. Morning, Orad. Hello. And uh, today's episode is special, isn't it? Do we want it to talk about it? It is very special. Yeah, so, okay, let me tell everyone who is in our episode today. So, actually, we have got my traveling buddy, the new buddy that I've got, <laughs> like Barros, is actually in our podcast today. How cool is that? So, a very w- welcome, Mike, to our podcast episode. How are you really, doing? Really great to be here. So, just to explain the traveling buddy thing, um, we were at the uh, camp in Australia in Melbourne, uh, yes. and um, we had to fly back both of us had to fly back to Sydney we had our flight cancelled the replacement flight was delayed um, but we at least had each other to talk to so that was that was fun <laughs> that's a that's a very common issue we have in Australia lots of domestic flight uh, cancel uh, maybe they couldn't balance between the demand and their capacity quite possibly yeah. Yeah. they're upstream the one- <laughs> The one we were on was completely full, so I think that's probably true. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, but however, we could actually take advantage of that situation, and we did check in together, so everything worked well at the end, and now we have Mike with us. So, Mike, actually, um, I think everyone would be interested in the workshop that you did before the Kanban Australia conference. That was the first Kanban conference in Australia. So do you want to tell everyone about it, a little bit like sneak peek? Yes. So, um, yeah, I'm, I was really excited to come to Australia. So invited to do the uh, opening keynote at the Kanban Australia conference. Um, I suppose my credentials for that is uh, the Kanban from the Inside book, um, which in turn was inspired by a blog post of mine, introducing Kanban through its values. So I'm, 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 the, I'm the guy responsible for the, the values model. Um, if you've, if you've heard Kanban explained in terms of transparency, collaboration, balance and so on, uh, that was me. Um, so that was 2013. Um, since 2015, 2016 or so, I've been really focused on engagement. So, you know, I, uh, as a Kanban trainer, I, I couldn't help noticing that very often when I was doing private training that half the people in the class didn't know why they were there. <laughs> you know, there's definitely some conversations that weren't happening. And talking to other trainers, this isn't unusual. And so I've really, I, I'm a, from 2016 or so, I, I started telling people that I've devoted what, the rest of my career to outcomes. You know, the conversations around outcomes, what is it we really want to, to have happen? You know, then what happens? Start to have conversations in the language of needs, obstacles, and outcomes, organize those into strategy, and then think about the different kinds of strategy where that kind of conversational and participatory approach is useful and appropriate. And that turns out to be quite broad. Um, that's taken taking me into questions of leadership and organization. And so that's what last week's workshop was about, leading in a transforming organization. Uh, so using that language of outcomes to really explore how organizations work, a really interesting relational model of organization, thinking about relationships that not just between people and between teams, but between them and their work in which you know Kanban fits really well, um, how delivery relates to strategy, uh, the role of things like trust building in organizations and so on. It's a really fascinating model. It's actually um, und- underneath it all is a model from the 20th century, the viable system model. Um, and I've sort of uh, dusted it down um, and made it more accessible, um, but also made it more complexity friendly as well in, in, the, in the 21st century sense. Um, and making it accessible and making things complexity friendly actually go together because we want people to participate and to engage 
Um, and you know, if all you have is very complicated models that can only be used by experts, you're not really getting engagement. Um, so that's yes, that's 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 how things are done in the 21st century. How they should how they how they should be. I think you know, I'm I kind of been a champion for outcome oriented change as an as as opposed to solution driven change. I mean, too much in the agile world really is about imposing frameworks on people, imposing imposing processes and practices on people, denying people agency, making work less meaningful, um, and work can be meaningful and it, and it is it is so you know it can be so fantastic when it when it is um the quite a long answer to your question there but that, that's the kind of space that i work in outcomes yeah. As the, yeah as the headline um but exploring lots of issues of leadership and strategy and meaningfulness and so on it's a yeah, really that was... set right or right? like I mean, I, I would assume now after listening to that, everyone can understand what the workshop was about. Uh, however, I have one more question before I give it to Aron. Uh, you, uh, in your keynote in Kanban Australia, you did mention about a lot about, like you have focused the relationship a lot more and also you have drawn attention to the human aspect of yes. organization, which is very important. So maybe it is a good reminder to everyone. And if you could talk a little bit about that. Yes, I mean, I think I've I've sought to emphasize that actually for quite a long time. If you if you go back to Kanban from the inside, I described it as the humane start with what you do now approach to change. And I know that it's sort of humanity is something that um, people have really appreciated about it. And we, as we as we said um, when we were talking um, in the airport, you know, um, I, I get an amazing um, reception in places like India because that's a country that that appreciates that. Um, you know, it, everything it can't all be about process. Everything can't be all, all about structure and practices and techniques and things. Not that those things aren't important, but um, you know, the, the, the humanity of it is really important. The, the meaning, the meaning we get out of work um, is important, and it's very easy. It's a trap that that organisations fall into is where it all becomes process driven. And it's all about improving the process, speeding the process up and so on. And actually we forget what we're in business to do. <laughs> and, you know, we kind of lose care for each other and lose empathy for the customer. And working back from what the customer really needs, how the work we're gonna do is actually gonna help, help meet them in their times of struggle, help them make meaningful progress and so on. And how we learn from that process of meeting those needs, you know, that, 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 that makes it so much more meaningful. Um, so yeah, I've been focused on that for a long time. Um, at, when we're talking about organizations and the relational approach to organizations, um, you can think about what effect are these different relationships having? The relationships, and I say again, not only between people, uh, but between people, their work, how that work is organized, how that work is coordinated, how we strategize to decide what the next next bits of work are going to be, what the changes are going to be, how that relates also to like our identity and our purpose and so on. All these things are related and every relationship there is also an opportunity for dysfunction. And the dysfunctions are felt by people and, and, and it's important never, never to forget that. And those dysfunctions, when they are resolved, they make the work better for people and they make it better for the organization. The organization is more effective. So it's win all round. You know, it's not, I'm not trading off the human experience with the effectiveness of the organization. Get these relationships balanced and productive and healthy, then it's better for everyone. Lovely. Thanks, Mark. I think that was a really great uh, summary of your workshop and what you focus on. And I really enjoyed it. Uh, because I had a technical background, so I used to be a developer for a very long time, yep, yep, and I'm too. very, yep. and I'm very outcome oriented person naturally. So I like yep. to see results. Yes. And you talk about, uh, you know, complexity friendly, which I really yes. like the terminology. Yes. So, what is the reason, based on your experience, that a lot of people still not aware of the relation between people and their work, people and the customer, and the human aspect of these changes. 
Yes, I, I think that's, that's that's a very good question, and and that problem is a really common one. Uh, and I, it's certainly very prevalent in in the in the software industry, um, and I guess in other industries too. Um, although many people say they are results oriented, outcome oriented, and so on, actually we are very solution driven. And what actually happens is that we choose our solutions, and we use outcomes to sell those solutions. And then we live with all the consequences, good and bad, of implementing those implementing those solutions, um, and that is backwards, you know. Mm. And 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 this, I mean, this is this is why I've written my my later book, you know, agenda shift and right to left. That's really flipping that round. What if we put uh, outcomes first? What if we built strategy in the language of outcomes? What if we let solutions follow? And what you end up is with a more granular strategy and much more granular solutions, because your solutions are, you know, responses to particular outcomes, outcomes large and small, but mostly small, how we measure progress, how we measure success, the obstacles we want to overcome in order to achieve that success, all of those things guide our choice of choices, plural, of solutions. And the great thing is that you, you're much, it's a much more robust kind of strategy when you do it that way around. If you choose a solution and sell it with outcomes, and then the solution doesn't work, or it's disappointing as so often as it is. I mean, we, we all know the, the, you know, the, the failure record of these large monolithic implementations. You know, if your solution doesn't work or it disappoints, what are you left with? Mm. All you're left with is those negative consequences. If you've got a strategy made of outcomes and a solution doesn't work, well, you try another solution. <laughs> you know, mm. it's, it, it's, it sounds so simple. But it's a 180 degree change of direction. Outcomes before solutions, not outcomes to sell solutions. Mm. Um, it's a paradigm shift. I know, that, I know that's an overused phrase, but it genuinely is a, a paradigm shift. So yeah. what I've been doing for the, these last few years, since 2015, 2016, is explaining things like Agile, explaining things like Scrum, explaining things like Kanban in those outcome-oriented terms. And... Um, encouraging to people in a, to people to think in a more outcome oriented way and a less solution driven way and that actually comes really hard to the agile community I mean, it's ironic isn't it i mean every community has its ironies I and mean, that was actually um that was in the closing keynote of the conference wasn't it you know uh you know, all the ironies but the you know the irony of the agile community is that it puts uh, process before mm. most other things um, and if you're familiar with the agile manifesto you'll know why that is um yeah so so ironic but also it loves to put solutions first um you know we love to plow through our backlogs you know we've got all these solution ideas and we're going to plow through these solution ideas and and hope that they're going to meet going, going to meet needs and so often agile is actually explained in those terms you know um heads down uh, plowing through backlogs and mediocre experience often delivering mediocre results to the customers um, and if only we could work backwards from needs met, outcomes mm -hmm. realized, learning, you know, internalized, all, all that stuff. It is, it, it is compl a, a, such a different way of working. You know, it's, it's, it's chalk and cheese. You know, if you've worked in an environment that, that gets it, that does it, and you know how great it is and you want to, you, to help other organizations be able to work in that same way. But if you explain it in a left to right way, the chances are that most of the people you are talking to will miss the point and won't understand mm. really why it's different. Um, so I think it's really important we change change how we how we explain this stuff. Yeah, that was really amazing. Uh, you know, uh, I totally agree with you. We are very solution oriented, and we yes. all want to prove that our solution is yes. always the best yes. solution. Yes. Maybe I, that's I actually, how even, we I'll learn. Get... I will go even further than that, solution driven rather than solution oriented. When we're something driven, driven we hold on to it for too long. Okay. And I like we, ho it. we hold on yeah. we, we hold on to these solutions way too long. Yes. And you know, instead we should be a lot more humble about them, a lot more ready to test things, um, a lot more ready to turn things into hypotheses, make things do things in you know smaller steps, more granular. That doesn't mean we can't think big, it doesn't mean we can't have some big goals. But we need to, you know, we need to achieve them in a in a much more a much more iterative way.
Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And also sometimes we just define ourselves with those solutions. Yes, yes. And then without that solution, then we lose our identity. So yes, who am yes. I? Well, that yes. Solution, you know? Scrum master, Kanban trainer. I mean, you know, you know, the the, the, yes. the, the traps are there. I mean, the, the the traps are 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 built into the system, and it's uh, yes, it's funny, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. No, I like that. And you know, uh, I normally tell people that when you decide the solution first, then before that solution, you had a problem. Yes. But now you have two problems. <laughs> because what you try to do is, uh, what you try to do is to yes. change that the first problem yes. uh, until it fit to this solution, yes. rather than you change the solution to fit the problem. Yes, yes, that's a really I, I like that way of putting it. Um, and I, I put a similar idea. You know, um, very often the implementation of the solution becomes the thing. Yes. Yes. Um, right. And yes. that is a, that is actually a distraction. That's a distraction that businesses can't afford. Yeah, perfect. Well, I like, I like your way, way of doing it as well. Now you have two problems. I mean, it's a it's, 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 it's an old it's an old joke, but it is a, it does really apply here. That's good. <laughs> yeah, and uh, just by the way, uh, Soma is not feeling well today. That's why she doesn't talk too much. Just wanted to uh, let everyone know. It was all, it was all that talking the, that's the the reason I talk. Yeah, <laughs> that's the she's, reason. Got no, she's got no voice left. <laughs> exactly. She talks too much. Um, I didn't all say right. That. <laughs> <laughs> so now I'd like to a little bit step back and uh, talk to you a bit about your journey with Kanban, how you started, and uh, what happened that uh, you know you are sitting here now and you are Mike today. Yes. I like a lot of things. It kind of started by accident. Um, mm -hmm. And the uh, the accident was the credit crisis. I talked a bit about the credit crisis in my keynote. You know, it's an important part of my, my, my personal story. Um, and without going into too much detail, I was working for a Swiss bank. And Swiss bank, certainly back, back in, in those days, weren't quite the environment for working collaboratively with other people from other organizations it was you know I, I i didn't really feel like i was part of the agile community uh back then um although you know i i, I did a lot of reading in that area you know um i think my whole i remember one team i worked in every team member had was given a copy of the uh, kent beck's um XP, xp book for example um so we were certainly certainly aware of it and actually we were a very agile organization actually um uh but when 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 the credit crunch hit and um i actually had, i was very fortunate in a way fortunate i had um several months of garden, gardening leave and i used that time to actually hang out with agile communities went to meetups got to know some you know very interesting people and so on and then when i was actually able able to to work, you know, released from my my gardening gardening leave, um, I became the CTO of a late stage car startup mm -hmm. um, based in Budapest in Hungary. Uh, I used to do a week in Budapest, a week in the UK, a week in Budapest, a week in the UK on budget airlines. I mean, it was in the travel part of it was horrific, um, but actually it was a really interesting bit of work. And it actually that was the it became the case. I didn't know it at the time, but that became the case study for um, Kanban from the inside. Um, I became quite active on the Kanban Dev mailing list, which was like the main forum for uh, Kanban, you know, back in those days. Um, and, you know, yeah, by, by 2014, 2015, I was effectively, you know, one of its moderators. Um, I did the CTO job for 18 months. Um, then that was taken over and that actually created the opportunity for me to leave um, in a good way, in a happy way. Um, and I then did a masterclass with David. Uh, he actually invited me to it. Um, little did I know that he had in mind for me a little consulting gig. Um, so uh, I, after the masterclass, found myself in South Africa working as a Kanban consultant. Um, and uh, worked for a while after that, um, helping David with the training material, uh, helped to set up uh, what, as what was then called Lean Kanban University. Um, you know, went to the leadership retreats and all that, all that kind of stuff. 
So that takes me up to about 20. Oh, no, I've, of course, there's the, the blog post introducing Kanban through its values and then the book. Um, so, um, yeah, create, creating the values model. I, I, I think it's going a bit too far to say that was a reboot of Kanban, but it did provide a new and more humane perspective on Kanban that it, I think actually it desperately needed. Um, I love Kanban, really appreciate Kanban, but it's also very easy to fall into traps of thinking it's all about, you know, statistics and metrics mm. and process and so on. Um, it is, in the at the end of the day, a tool, and we use, use tools in the right way if we're using them with people, using them in, in organizations. Uh, and the, the values, they, weren't, they didn't come from nowhere. Um, they were actually an abstraction of the principles and practices, uh, and they just provide a, a helpfully humane um, abstraction of, of what I still think very, very effective principles and practices. Um, so, you know, it, it wasn't done in a vacuum. I'm just super glad that it resonated with people. And that is by far my most successful uh, blog post. Uh, the Kanban from the Inside book did, did very well as well. Um, I kind of stopped counting after I sold 10,000 copies because that was my target. <laughs> um, but it, it, still, it still sells. Um, people still appreciate that book, I, 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 and it's blowing my own trumpet. But I think it is still one of the one of the, one of the best books on Kanban uh, uh, available. Um, and uh, you know, I'm, and although I sort of moved to the edge of that community, I have my own stuff to develop. Um, in no way do I am I disparaging that 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 previous work or or the community or anything like that. It, it, it was an important part of my own my own journey. Lovely, that was really good. So maybe. Uh, without even I know I learned a lot from you then <laughs> because what the Kanban today we're talking about it's influenced by you as well yes I mean I, I, I did make an impact I mean you know I, I'm, I'm aware of yeah. that I'm proud of that and um I'm, you know I'm not walking away from it um and and it's and it's really lovely actually to be invited back to you know a Kanban conference so Kanban Australia Given the opening keynote of the first Kanban Australia, that's that's a that's a cool thing. I'm going to India in December, so, you know, same idea. Given given a keynote at Kanban India, and I'm you know I'm really I'm really grateful for these opportunities, especially Australia. I should say, my son moved to Sydney. This is where I am, am now. Um, uh, last year. Um, yeah, so, and, uh... yeah. And any opportunity to come to Sydney, uh, gratefully received. <laughs> or any opportunity to come to Australia, <laughs> gratefully received. <laughs> exactly. I remember in the conference, uh, you said that the last time you've been in Australia, it was like 30 years ago. It was. It's actually more than 30 years ago. I'm going to show you my age a bit. It was, a very, it, was, it was the very first business trip I ever did. Um, and I thought they were all like that. Um, I ended up staying, staying at the Manly Pacific Hotel. <laughs> <laughs> going by the ferry into the rocks every day, every evening um it was the, it was the most amazing trip ever um two weeks of that i gave one presentation to the australian navy in that time and listened to a lot of other presentations um so it was a helicopter simulator project uh, for the australian oh. navy um so that, yeah I, I started with a very technical background i was working on yeah in, um, good real, real i like people who had technical background yeah i did a master degree before that so <laughs> you know i i um yeah technical things appealed to me i didn't realize actually that it could be fun as well oh, um, yes. there's nothing like having real users mm. and real feedback and where you can see that your work is meeting somebody's needs I, I actually enjoy the gratification of that as well much as i enjoyed technical challenges as well yeah. I do have a question for that. I know that you know you both have technical background. I have technical background as well. But my observation is also that you know sometimes that could be more like act as a bias where people just want to be in their own uh world. Yes. Solutions. So, uh, what do you have any experiences on this? Oh, abs absolutely. And I think becoming suddenly aware of that was actually quite important. Um, when I worked in investment banking, I I got I, I kind of persuaded myself that if I understood the code, if I understood understood the trading system, then I understood the business. And then I went down to the trading floor and saw that around the monitors of the traders were tons and tons of post-it notes. And the post-it notes were making up for deficiencies in the system. Um, you know, um, our system captured trades. It wasn't an order management system. There was a whole life cycle. There's a whole load of stuff that was happening over, over the phone, over Bloomberg or whatever, that our systems didn't, didn't manage and uh, didn't, didn't, didn't help with. Um, so that was a real eye-opener for me. 
Um, and I learned that quite early in my, my banking career. And um, 10 years later, as you know, from the keynote, I ended up managing the department that I that 10 years previously had been a developer in after a big tour around the bank. Um, and uh, one of the things we instituted there was having every developer spend time, a, a, you know, a serious chunk of time, you know, a week, you know, days, certainly several days, I forget the exact amount, but several days on the trading floor or in some other part of the business, really understanding how that, that, that thing w went. And the business really invested in it as well. You know, they really, you know, really made people feel welcome. They gave them presentations about, you know, what this particular trading desk was about or the department was, was about. Um, and you got some real collaboration and real information flow in both directions. So traders got to understand actually there's things the systems could do that they weren't aware of. Um, developers would come back to the department and say, how do they put up with systems so awful? You know, I mean, that, that, that's a bit unfair, but there were, there were things that we could do that would make the systems so much more effective um, for, for our users. Um, and I've seen that time and time again since. I worked in government digital after I, after I left um, finance and energy. Um, and developing a, a, a lot of the secret to government, government digital uh, for, a, for a period of years in the UK was a really exciting thing. And actually the rest of the world was watching what the UK was doing. Uh, we borrowed from Estonia and uh, we did a British version of what Estonia was doing. And you can see like the states and other countries, you know, copying, copying that model or, or, or adapting the model to their own, own, own circumstances. But developing empathy for the end user was an important part of it. Um, user needs, not government needs, was the, was the mantra. And um, in product development now, you know, I always point people at uh, things like Jobs to be Done, Job Stories, a great book by Bob Moester. I always like to recommend to people Demand Side Sales 101. You wouldn't think that a book called Demand Side Sales 101 would be relevant to uh, people in Agile, but it totally is. And it's totally about empathizing with users at the time they have their needs, the when of their needs. You know, we start user stories with the who of the needs, but the when is really, really important. You don't really understand a feature. You don't really understand a user story until you understand the when of the, of the user needs. So yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been massive for me, actually. You know, um, understanding the difference between technology and, and situations and needs, the time, the time when these things are important and so on. Yeah, that, that's, that my thinking has changed a lot since the time when I thought that the code was everything. Mm -hmm. Very good. So maybe a little bit irrelevant, but what was the most challenging part of this transformation for you when you decided to kind of stop coding and yes. work with people what was because probably a lot of people want you know will go or want to go through this journey yes uh yeah what happened how that helped you to become a better practitioner i did it um it, it took me multiple attempts i think i think I, the first time i thought i would leave development and go into something else i actually hated it and actually went back into back into technology um and then I grew into it in a, in a supportive environment. I mean, UBS, the bank I was working for, was actually very good at developing developing people, um, and uh, I, I I benefited from from quite a substantial career there. I was there for there for more than ten years. You know, I rose from being a a contract developer to being an executive director. Um, there's a lot a lot of you know a lot of personal growth happening in that. Um, I actually found that when I went to being a manager of managers, that was perhaps the most satisfying time of my, my corporate career. Um, and I realized that, you know, it wasn't my job to micromanage what team members were doing. It was my job to work with the leaders of teams and to help them, uh, help them grow um, and help them help give the, the, them to give space to the people in their teams and so on. And I, interestingly, I, I replaced a micromanager. Mm -hmm. uh, the, my very first um, day arriving in that role, I actually had a queue of people arriving at my desk asking me what they should be doing. <laughs> I just think how ridiculous that is. You know, I'm, I've just literally just arrived and there are people asking me uh, what they should be doing. 
Um, so I, I replaced someone with, a, let's just say, a very different leadership style to mine. Um, you know, I actually said to them, you know, I'm not going to tell you what to do. That will make you miserable and it will make me miserable. Um, and you, you, know, you, you and your teams are going to work some of these things out for yourselves. I will work with your team leads and, and help you work out how these things uh, should work in general rather than, rather, rather than specifics. Um, and when you take that kind of approach, you're actually making the organization a lot more resilient and a lot more adaptable. You know, um, a leader who is a single point of failure is not a good leader in my, in my estimation. Um, you know, we need to, to build teams that can think for themselves. And that does involve developing leadership. I'm not against leadership at all. I'm not against management at all, but it's about, you, you, need, you need at every level teams that can think for themselves, organizations that think for themselves, where you're, one of the things you're doing, this, this is part of the new, the new material. If you want self-organization, if you want emergence, if you want resilience, all these kinds of things, you need to increase and distribute decision-making capacity. And you need plenty of communication. And this has actually been known since, since, since the middle of the last century, actually, um, that, you know, emergence comes from, it comes from, distribution, it comes from relationships, it comes from decision making capacity, it comes from communication, developing all those things. And I think it's not understood actually well enough in the agile community that we don't we don't improve process for its own sake. We improve process for what it can enable. Mm -hmm. And yes, it can enable faster, more responsive customer delivery, but that's not the half of it. You know, it has such an impact on the organization as well. You know, if, if, your, if your, your team is communicating well, making its own decisions well, that is freeing up communication bandwidth and decision-making capacity in the wider organization too. You know, if you want anything that explains the unreasonable effectiveness of Agile, I think it is that. You know, and to think it is all about speed is to miss the point. Mm. Um, so uh, yeah, that's but but it takes a certain amount of um, understanding of organisation to to really appreciate that. So you know that the, the new stuff I'm doing, the adaptive organisation, the deliberately adaptive organisation, that is my you know, like 21st century take on vi vi viable systems. Um, you know that 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 is what that's about. Adaptive organization. The deliberately adaptive organization. The training actually is, is just called adaptive organization, two parts, business agility at every scale and between mm -hmm. spaces, scopes and scales. You saw in the keynote, actually, I paid a lot of attention to the relationships between different scales of organization. Uh, again, something is not very well understood. Um, and something not very well understood, you will do something over, over simple um, which sounds attractive, but actually it ends up being very clumsy. Um, so we turn everything into hierarchies. And I think, you know, that's, so we have hierarchical organizations, we have hierarchies of work breakdown structures, you know, epic, saga, you know, feature, user story, whatever, um, mm. in our tools that only understand hierarchies and so on. And we need a much healthier relationship. Work is much more multidimensional than that. Absolutely. If you look at a t if you look at a team, it has so many different dimensions that it needs to manage, and each of those dimensions has its own accountability relationships. Some of those actually what are what gives you a sense of belonging and identity and things as well. And untangling all of that is actually it's not yeah. that hard. To, it's not actually that hard to do, um, but untangling that is is actually quite important, I think. Yeah, and probably that's why you know micromanagers have a lot of problem because there are yes. so many aspects and complexity yeah. in this team and it's very difficult for yeah, them well, to can, micromanage think, everything yeah well they can only think top down um yeah. and actually emergent things happen bottom up absolutely, um, absolutely. and you um, and a lot of time yeah. sorry to interrupt you but a lot of time if we don't do anything the people themselves understand the problem and solve yes. it themselves yes yes so i teach organization bottom up i'm um, not the top down doesn't also you know it, it has its place um but if you understand how organizing organizing naturally works bottom up then when you are deliberately working on the organization you can go with the grain rather than against the grain um and i, and I think that's that's important and you know and work with people um, and invite people into the process all, you know all of that and that's actually part of making the that's actually 
speaks directly to that communication and, de and decision making capacity thing. So the way you go about change is actually modeling what a more adaptive organization feels like and looks like much more coherent than imposing change on organizations. Lovely. All right. So uh, during this uh, Kanban Australia, I was talking to someone and uh, I asked him that, what does Kanban mean to you? Yep. And he told me that if it's not Scrum, then it's Kanban. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> Uh, so what does Kanban mean to Mike? Uh, well, I think it's in the title of one of my books, Right to Left. Um, okay. And that idea of re reviewing work right to left, as we do when we review the Kanban board, um, that is that is the beginning of something quite cool. So you've got reviewing the work in terms of its completion, right to left, you know, that you start to get a sense of pull and flow from doing that. And that's the basis of coordinating well. And then you can start thinking about, well, what are we working backwards from? And how do we make that meaningful? And we're working backwards from someone's need met. That's my definition of done. Someone's needs met. Mm -hmm. And then there's my definition of really done. All the learning has been accounted for. So when you when you're working backwards from needs met, the learning accounted accounted for, you start to approach your work a bit differently. You describe it differently. You talk about it differently. The questions you ask, as you work backwards, as you work backwards column by column in your stand up meeting, those 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 are changing. You know whose need, what need, how do we know that we're actually meeting it? How will we know that we're being successful and so on? It changes that kind of language. And knowing also that we're going to be accounting for the learning at the end of the process as well, or you know, at the, at the end of the sprint or whatever it might be. I'm just basically saying there, Scrum and Kanban go together brilliantly. Um, there are aspects of, of, of Scrum that um, aren't so strong in Kanban. There are aspects of Kanban that aren't so strong in, in, uh, in, uh, in, in Scrum, and they go together really, really well. And that sense of the container for learning is something that's very much part of Scrum. And uh, it's concentrating all of that, you know, for two weeks or for a sprint, a week, whatever it might be. You know, these are our goals. These are the needs we're going to be trying to meeting, trying to be meeting. And at the end of the process, we're going to ask ourselves: not only did we go about it in the right way, is our process good, is our, are our practices the right ones, and so on, but also, did we have a good understanding of needs at the beginning? How well did we meet needs? What new needs did we uncover? Um, what assumptions did we make and were they good assumptions? What assumptions did we make about how we should work together, um, coordinate, collaborate, cooperate, as, as, we, as I talked about in the, in the keynote? Um, you're starting to make the process a lot deeper and a lot more meaningful. And it goes back to the kind of what we were talking about at, at, at the beginning of the, in, the interview. I, I think work should be meaningful. It's not for me to say how people should do what it's not for me to say how others should find meaning in their work. But if we create, create an environment rich enough, then people can. I mean, it, people take people take meaning from their work in different ways. For some people, it's about the craft. For some, it's about the relationships. For some, it's about meeting needs. For some, it might be just that they're, you know, they're, making, they're providing for their families. All of those are completely fine. All of those are valid reasons for work to be meaningful. But if you can't work out for yourself why this work should be meaningful, what what needed is meeting, you know, what impact we think this work is going to have, what what role this organization has in society, even. If you can't answer those kinds of questions, then what chance do other people have to find find work meaningful? And I think it is important from time to time that we explore that, not to impose it on other people, but explore that. Thank you very much, Mike. This is one of the conversation that I like never ends. Yes. But unfortunately, the only thing in this world is limited and fixed is time. <laughs> yes. And um, we almost reach to our time box. So, much. do you have uh, your last question from Mike? Oh, no, I actually enjoyed the whole, you know, conversation and especially the focus on human 
aspects of you know how we work in organizations so that's brilliant and maybe it's a good reminder for everyone that after all we are humans so let's just be humans and focus on how can we be better at what we do before the ai takes over <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> this is a really good reminder this is our superpower isn't it absolutely yes yeah absolutely yeah that was a really great conversation mike you talk a lot about solution driven i just take you know took some notes solution driven <laughs> what kanban means right to left i think that explain the agenda shift as well so thank you very much thanks for your time it was a pleasure to meet you in person in australia and yes. i hope it next time you know it won't be uh 30 years next time i next hope that too i hope i hope it'll be measured in months rather than years but we'll, we'll see yeah, we'll see <laughs> <laughs> we'd love to have you back mike and also i really hope the person who asked you or give you the answer that you know whatever is not scrum is kanban they listen to this episode and get some more knowledge about kanban so <laughs> And, and Mike, really, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. So I'm really looking forward to the next time we can take a flight back together. to <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you for having me on this podcast. Thank you for having me in Australia. Thank you, Australia. Thank you, Kanban Australia, uh, Daniel and the team as well. So that's, that's all, it's all been, all been great. I've really enjoyed my trip. I'm off flying, flying home tomorrow. Lovely. Have a safe trip. Thanks, thank everyone, you. for listening. And thank we you. come back next week. And thank you, Mike. Have a lovely trip back home and come back soon, please. I will. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.